Hello. Uh, my name is Herlidi. I'm associate professor in the School of Information Studies here at UWM. And I'm also the coordinator for the uh, information organization research group, group in the school. And today this event is uh, organized by our research group. We call ourselves uh, iOrg. Mm -hmm. um, uh, today we have a distinguished uh, uh, guest, uh, Professor How uh, Lynn Howard from the uh, University of Toronto. And uh, before I introduce her a little more formally, I'd like to have all of you uh, introduce yourself because I don't know probably one third of you here. Uh, and it will also give our guests a little bit uh, some sense that what, who are in the audience. Okay, so uh, Pierre? Okay, so I'm just here. I'm a postdoc in the program. I'm a postdoc in animation policy. And maybe you should also tell us uh, where you're from. Oh, I'm from France. <laughs> I am from Canada. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Charles. I'm a postdoc in the IOR group. IOR. And I'm from uh, Canada as well. I'm GSA and I came the first year in the other IOR. Nobody this time. Um, <laughs> and I'm a doctoral student uh, in the IOR group. I'm Hazel. I'm a first year master student. I'm Hope Olson. I'm a professor in the school. I'm somewhere around here. <laughs> I'm Richard Smaralia. I'm also a professor in the I work. Mm. I'm Quinn Lu. I'm a PhD student here. My major is IR and my name is Michael. I'm Tyler Smith. I'm from Milwaukee. Um, I'm a first year PhD student and I'm, I'm IO curious. <laughs> <laughs> That's some old week. I'm Tina, first semester PhD student, just moved here in June, major IR, minor IO. I'm Adriana McClear, I'm a first semester DAC student, and I'm working with information policy. I'm Renek Busniak, I'm from Wonsha, and I'm a first year PhD student, um, IR emphasis. And Ching, I'm a business scholar of the, uh, information studies. UWM. Uh, I come from China and I'm studying I studied in information retrieval. I'm China. I come from China too. I'm a visiting scholar to this school. Hi. <coughs> I'm Rakesh, Rakesh Babu, and I'm a faculty member here. And so is faculty there. I'm originally from India, but now Milwaukee is my home. And your area of specialty? My area of specialty is uh, accessibility and usability of information and communications technology, especially for people with disabilities. My name is Ellie Giro. I am an MLIS student here, and I'm from Green Bay. Excellent. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Only MLIS student in the audience. I'm Steve Miller, a lecturer in I.O. here. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> we were waiting for longer. <laughs> uh, Margaret Kip, uh, I'm an assistant professor in uh, IOR, um, and I'm also from Canada. That's a lot of other people. Here. <laughs> <laughs> we have a Canadian invasion here. <laughs> Today, our uh, guest is uh, Professor Lynn Howard. As I said, she is uh, from the University of Toronto Faculty of Information. And uh, she's uh, currently the Associate Dean for Research uh, and Chair of PhD program. Wow, um, you are so busy. <laughs> and um, Lynn also served as uh, their Dean from 1995 to 2003. Um, Lynn's research <coughs> interests are in uh, knowledge organization and uh, metadata issues. Knowledge organization, we call information organization here. And uh, Lynn also has an appointment with the school as the re uh, distinguished researcher in information organization. Thank you. Her being so gracious, she gave me her chair. So, um, so uh, there's one other uh, person in the room who uh, um, oh, yes, needs sorry. to acknowledge himself. I don't believe we've met before. No, I don't believe <laughs> <laughs> My name is 
Steve Marwolton. I'm also from Canada. I am from Dean of the School. Actually, I've known Lynn for over 20 years. We were doctoral contemporaries. Uh, we were child prodigies. <laughs> Well, thanks for coming, everyone. This is uh, just a lovely group to have, and uh, I know uh, I'm competing with the open house and with the first sunshine that we had in a few days, so I'm very grateful that you're uh, here today. Um, and I would like to thank uh, the school, uh, Dietmar, Hurley, uh, Hope, and uh, Richard, Steve, Margaret, um, and Charles for uh, all the for, the, for the invitation, for the colleagueship, and um, for just being a really great group to work with, so I'm very pleased to be here. Um, so I'm going to uh, tell you a story today, and um, it's a story that uh, relates to representation, sense making, and recall strategies. So I really did debate about whether or not to do PowerPoint, because uh, the, what I'm actually going to be covering here, because I needed a strong visual, um, is the uh, this handout. As I say, some of you, yes, some of you have the folded version, and uh, some of you have the unfolded version, and I'm sure you'll cope very well. Um, and uh, so I just thought for a little inspiration we would have uh, the, the little nun here on the inside uh, when we first open up. So if you uh, find yourself bored with the talk, you can always just uh, engage with the nun in some sort of a spiritual uh, <laughs> um, I, I think her outfit may be nicer than mine, too, but anyway. Um, so this, uh, to give you a little bit of context here, it's always nice to start with Mark Twain. When I was young, I could remember anything, whether it happened or not. <laughs> and this is actually uh, not only humorous, but very apropos of, of a story that I'm going to tell you about an individual whose name, anonymized, is Chuck. Chuck. So just to give you a little bit of a walk down memory lane, um, this is uh, a quote, memory is lost because we cannot find our way back to it. Our memory is always there. It's a matter of, uh, and I'm sure everyone has experienced that, uh, something will happen that will kind of tweak something that recalls a memory for you. And it may be a very long lost memory, although uh, there's so many youthful people in the room who may have uh, memories that are from a shorter time. Uh, but of course, all of our memories are created using our five senses, or we might call them modalities. And this is all very important to the way that our memory is actually structured. So uh, for those of you who uh, wanted a visual of the brain, and wanted it, whether you wanted it or not, uh, this is a, uh, just a, a, a brain here to show you some of the things that happen whenever uh, we are putting together a, a memory. Um, so we will get some sort of a sensory stimulation uh, for example, now that you've had your sandwiches, your gustatory area has been stimulated, and at some point in the future, uh, you may taste something that reminds you of the uh, wonderful Big John sandwich that you had today, and perhaps that will evoke all these memories of being gathered together with your, with your colleagues. Um, so each of the senses, of course, uh, is, will stimulate a part of the brain, um, and the uh, key to our memory is something called the hippocampus. And it's uh, buried very deeply within the brain, right on top of uh, the brain stem. That's as far as I'm going to go with anything medical. Um, so let's get back to something that looks a little more social science-y. So what happens when, we, um, when we're putting together a memory and then when we're recalling a memory? So here's the sensory information that comes into our short-term memory, and the hipp hippocampus is what uh, is the controller, so it will bring together all of that sensory information. So, so today, uh, you know, you're, um, you're eating, so your uh, sense of taste, it's your sense of smell, um, uh, you're, you may be seeing things, you, you're hearing things, um, and you know, you are touching things as well. So all of those uh, any memory that you may have around today may involve any or all of those uh, senses. And the hippocampus puts that all together in the short-term memory. 
that's the consolidation here, and that gets stored in our long-term memory. Now, you know, needless to say, if we remembered everything, and there are people who remember everything, and it's a very difficult life for, for them, and seriously so, uh, but of course we filter out a lot. But in terms of uh, whatever, whatever we perceive is stored, and it goes into our long-term memory, and uh, long-term memory is in the uh, neocortex, um, so uh, the cortex in the upper part of the brain. So what happens then when we recall a memory? Well, it's a kind of a, uh, a back, backwards or backup kind of a process. So we get the sensory information uh, that may stimulate a memory or we may just be thinking about something and it comes back in to uh, our perception and we can, we can recall that. And every time we recall a memory, that's called rehearsal. So over and over again, and those of you who've studied for exams know very well the concept of rehearsal. If you're memorizing something um, or you're learning something, you're going over it time and time again, bringing it from the long-term memory into your short-term memory and, uh, and then it goes back and is stored again. So every time we recall something, we are reinforcing that memory. So um, I'm not going to tell you a story about Chuck. And uh, this is a story of a pilot study that we are doing as part of a larger study, uh, working with individuals who have been um, diagnosed and are in the early stages of Alzheimer's dementia. So it is a, a cognitive impairment that continues to progress across time. Uh, some of the literature and the research that's been done suggests that you can uh, slow the, the progress of the disease. It is not something that can be reversed. It is not, uh, as you know, Alzheimer's dementia is not uh, curable, uh, at least not at this, at this point, although there are many who are working on it. Um, so what happens, of course, in Alzheimer's dementia, and it's not just one it's, it's not a one kind of disease. Uh, they're, uh, sort of basically put, the connections, the connectors within the brain can be damaged in some way. And classically, with Alzheimer's dementia, you may know of the, the, uh, the plaques, the, the plaque tangles, which will um, uh, impede the transfer of, or the connections that happen the synapses, the neurons, and so on. Uh, I'm not going to get medical here, but let's just say things can get pretty clogged up. But there, the disease can progress in different ways. So sometimes somebody's speech will be affected first. Uh, sometimes their memory for faces or names will be affected. Uh, but it is a progressive disease, and it does eventually uh, lead to death. So um, you may be sitting there thinking, what does this have to do with information? So just bear with me and it, the story will unfold. Uh, so what we decided to do is to engage in a study of individuals who have mild cognitive impairment, early stage Alzheimer's dementia. And what we were interested in was looking at their sense making and recall strategies. So that idea, if I go back to, to here, if there were ways that we could assist or encourage this kind of recall over and over again to reinforce a memory. So, you know, memory, going back to power, memory is not lost. We just need to figure out how to get back to it. So, um, we decided to, uh, oops, we're not there yet. Um, we decided to engage in this study, and of course we needed to uh, do a pilot first. Uh, and this is one of three individuals who were uh, in the, the pilot, then uh, this was done over uh, the, the past summer. So Chuck is um, a male, somewhere in the age of uh, 50 to 55, so very early diagnosis. Um, and uh, we asked Chuck to come, this was through the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto, uh, we asked him to come and take part in this, this study. And uh, so he arrived, and I'll just uh, draw you to the, to the inside portion. So I'm going to walk you through um, 
where we have the visuals here. So using um, a method that's, that's called uh, interpretive biographical methodology, and that's a very open-ended, uh, you get someone started <coughs> on telling you a life story. It could be an event, uh, some, some part of their life history. And uh, so we started off with a very, very simple question. And that's right at the top, across the top panel here. And so the, uh, this was encouraging Chuck to engage in what we called an open-ended open reflection. So there was no script, there was one question just to get him started. So um, I asked him, I said, you know, tell me, tell me uh, something that you'd like to do. Hugely open-ended. And of course, it just takes a little bit of time to get going, so Chuck was started off saying, well, I really like Sudoku, um, uh, I'm not much of a jock, um, and I said, well, um, are there any physical activities you would like to do? And he started talking then about, well, you know, I've always enjoyed hockey. Now, you know, there are a lot of Canadians in the room. That's what we're known for. And Chuck didn't disappoint. He was right in character. Uh, but he started talking about, uh, he said, well, you know, when I was a, when I was a kid, I, uh, growing up in Toronto, I grew up in a place called Little Italy, which is uh, a part of Toronto, which uh, at least when Chuck was growing up, uh, had a, a very large Italian pop population. And he talked about um, the kinds of food that his friends would eat and things that they would do. And, and then he went on to tell this story about, um, oh, and of course he went to his elementary and high school at uh, Catholic school, so he talked about um, the kinds of instruction they got from the nuns and, and the things that they did to the nuns. And, I can't really say much about his immortal soul, but anyway. Um, and so he talked about uh, what it was like at school, and, and uh, then he told this story about um, uh, that he and his friends used to play in, he, he said we were, it wasn't a very wealthy, it wasn't, it was a poor neighborhood. We didn't have things like uh, hockey cushions and hockey rinks, uh, so we would play in parking lots, and he said, ah, oh, I, we played in this parking lot of the Hillroy Stationery. I, I don't know whether there's Hillroy in the United States, uh, but it is a stationery. Um, they they make um, you know those those old things, uh, notebooks and uh, three ring binder paper and that kind of thing. And of course, they've branched out since then. So he talked talked about this because he he said. Uh, uh, if you, do you know who, he said to me, do you know who started that company? And I said, I have no idea. He said, well, it was Roy Hill, of course. Roy Hill started that company, so that's why it's called Hillroy. Um, and he said, it's a very stylized uh, uh, name, in which you can actually see in the uh, pictorial here, the, the Hillroy. He said, big H, and he said, very sweeping. So he told me this story about playing hockey in the parking lot and some of the other antics that they got up to and, and so on. And uh, he talked a little bit more and then came to this story about, um, and he was a great participant because he pretty well talked. It was a 45 minute session. Uh, I just let him go every once in a while. I might, you know, ask him for something, a uh, probe for some clarification, but it was in no way structured on my part. This was, this was Chuck telling his story. So uh, he talked about being in grade 12, and he said, I'll never forget the day that uh, my grade 12 teacher walked in, into class and said, said to us, this is a, one of the most important days in history. Do you know what happened today? And, what it, and he said, and I was the only one who put up my hand and said, yes, the Dow Jones broke 1,000 points today. Of course, from today's perspective, we're thinking, Phew, is that all? Um, but that was a big deal. And um, um, so he told that story, and then he went on to talk about more about school, um, talked about the fact that uh, he got into a little bit of trouble at school. Um, because he had registered late, he had to take typing. And uh, again, this is maybe something that will seem a little esoteric to you, but anyway, he had to take typing, and he said, and I knew I was going to fail. And so my dad had to go and talk to the vice principal, and then he started talking about his dad. 
And Terrence said his dad had worked for Canada Packers, which is a, a meat uh, processing, meat packing company. And um, his dad had then gone on to work in the federal government as a meat inspector. So he said, um, my dad was always worried about losing his job because he didn't speak French. So a, 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 a prime minister of Canada at the time, Pierre Trudeau, brought in official bilingualism, French and English. And he said, my dad thought he was going to lose his job because he couldn't speak French. And, uh, but he said he made it to retirement. So, so that's sort of the course of the, the story that, um, that Chuck uh, told. So 45 minutes, very pleasant, chatting back and forth. And uh, I made an appointment to see Chuck a couple of weeks later. So in the meantime, uh, as I was taking notes, um, I tried to highlight things where he got particularly animated. Uh, and highlight going through the notes, uh, trying to figure out um, what sorts of memories had more affect to him that really, really brought out um, uh, his passion, you might put it that way. So uh, about two, three weeks later, I went back to see him and uh, I brought six tokens. And the six tokens are the ones that you see here. There's the, uh, the little nun figure. There's a map of Italy. There's a stock chart. Probably looks more familiar today with all of that downward trend. Uh, Hilroy, the stationery company, that's the stylized uh, brand name. There's a stamp, a commemorative stamp of uh, Pierre Trudeau, the Prime Minister, who brought in bilingualism. And then there's a, uh, an archival photo of a, of a Canada Packers delivery truck. So these were uh, tokens that I spread out on the table. And uh, after some pleasantries, I said to, uh, to Chuck, uh, I have some things here. Uh, is there uh, something that, you know, if you want to, does anything strike you here? So keeping it very open-ended. And he looked at these things. And uh, so the reason I, I reproduced the, uh, the nun in, in the uh, large print edition here uh, so that you can see, he picked up the nun. Now remember that his, his story talked a lot about being raised in um, Catholic, the Catholic school environment and um, the impact of the nuns on his educational experience. And he picked up the, the, the little nun token. It was about this big and it kind of looks like a thimble, but it's just a little wooden token that's hand painted. Um, I think it might be a gray nun or something anyway. Uh, and he picked this up and he said, and if you want to cast your eyes down to the bottom, he said, um, hmm, this looks like a Dungeons and Dragons uh, token. Uh, so much for religion. Um, <laughs> and, and then he sort of put it down. And uh, then the next thing he looked at was the, the Hilroy. I had brought in a Hilroy uh, notebook. And he, he picked that up and with great excitement said, wow, look at this, here's a Hilroy notebook. And uh, then he proceeded, so that reminds me of the time when we used to play hockey, and he pretty much uh, retold that story in um, pretty close to verbatim. You know, there were, and in, in addition to that, he added a, a few other uh, points to his story. And um, then uh, He's looking at these other things, and he picked up the map of Italy, and he said, uh, oh, oh, Italy, uh, no, I've never been to Italy. So again, his childhood, living in Little Italy, had made a huge impact on him when we first spoke. And he was um, looking at this map and saying, I've never been to Italy, but I hope to do that sometime in my life. And he's looking at this map, and if you could, uh, if you could see it in a larger format, there, there's... Um, the, the city of Bologna is in the north of Italy. And so he was looking at the map and he said, oh, there's Bologna, pointed to that. At which point he said, hmm, Bologna, that's like baloney. That's, my dad was a meat packer. And he went on to talk about his dad, which then um, uh, led to some other stories around his family and so on. So there were different stories that, <coughs> that came out of, out of that. And I had thought maybe once he got to talking about his dad, and his dad working for Canada Packers, that maybe he would uh, acknowledge 
the, um, the stamp that had the portrait of Pierre Trudeau, but he did not make that connection. Uh, and I'll come back to that in just a minute. And then, the, then finally, there was only one thing left on the table. And he said, oh, look, at there's a stock chart. Did I ever tell you the story, he says, about the time I was in grade 12 and my teacher came in and da 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 da. So again, a very, very, um, uh, and the story was pretty close to verbatim and it was uh, very rich and further enhanced. Uh, so that was the end of that session. And um, about five weeks later, I was back at the Alzheimer's Society for another reason, meeting with a client group there. And um, Chuck was part of this group. And he said, uh, uh, the facilitator, one of the, the social workers in the group, said, uh, you know, is there anything anyone would like to, any announcements anyone would like to make? And Chuck says, oh, I want to tell you about this thing I did with Lynn. And she, you know, we were just talking and it was really great and I got to say a whole bunch of things about myself. And, you know, no one else listens to me as much as she did. And, um, he was very loquacious. And he said, yeah, it was really cool. He said, uh, he said, she brought some things. He said, you know, she brought this stamp of Pierre Trudeau. And um, Pierre Trudeau was, and then he looks around the room and he says, do any of you know who Pierre Trudeau is? And I don't, I think some of you know, whatever. And he said, well, Pierre Trudeau was the one, the prime minister brought in official bilingualism. And then he went on to tell the story about his dad. So that was five weeks. That was eight weeks after the initial and five weeks after the follow up with the tokens. So um, we were trying to make some uh, sense out of this because um, if I could take you back to the, I, I'm telling a story rather than following the uh, traditional research story here. But um, what we were interested in uh, was if we could in fact determine um, sort of the, uh, the, the capacity of uh, representations to evoke memory. Uh, and representation, of course, uh, the representation of something, uh, it was not the real thing, um, obviously, um, for <coughs> the nun, I didn't have a real nun there, I didn't have one of his real teachers there, uh, but it had something that I thought might evoke that memory, a representation of nunness, if we might put it that way. Um, so, we were interested in exploring uh, how or if these representations might in fact uh, evoke some kind of uh, memory of a, of a life event, in this case uh, Chuck's life events. And um, we're also interested in if in fact it did evoke a memory, how well did it evoke that memory, um, and also if the representations, those tokens, the six tokens in Chuck's case, um, influenced the story in, in any particular way. Now, I want to emphasize there are two things that we are not doing. We are not measuring change. We are not testing at the beginning and saying, what is this individual's cognitive ability and how, how does it change across time? And the second uh, thing that, um, that we are not doing is looking for repetition accuracy. Uh, so if Chuck wanted to tell the same story, great. If Chuck wanted to tell a different story about the token, that that's, tells us something more too uh, about the evocation of memory. And if Chuck told a story that was entirely wrong, if you will, that's okay too. The point here is it's Chuck's story. So what we're looking at in terms of the story uh, is, again, just the evocation, that reconstruction of memory, but as Chuck is doing it himself. And the reason I mention that is that one of the things that we've been looking at is our, our theoretical underpinning, and there are actually two. Uh, number one is textual narrative. Do we see some sort of patterns in the recall of these memories, number one? Um, and the, um, so in addition to the, the textual uh, narrative, do we also see something that comes up 
in the research that, that deals with autobiographical uh, <coughs> self-representation, where I might tell her Lee a story, and tomorrow I might tell Margaret the same story, but I'm going to tell the Margaret version of the story because my the way I relate to Margaret may be different than the way I relate to her Lee. So I might want Margaret to think I'm a much more important person in that story than the person that I was in the story that I told her Lee. So whenever we tell a story or retell a story about ourselves, it's the autobiographical um, uh, life, uh, life histories, people will bring out different aspects to showcase or uh, self-reflect with others. Uh, so it's Chuck's story. It's not for us to say, oh, sorry Chuck, you missed that detail. Thank you for playing. You're out of the game. It was nothing like that. We were just looking to see, were there any patterns in the narrative? And moreover, how, if a story, if a, a memory was evoked, how did that memory change? Was it enhanced? Uh, was it slightly different? Were there different people in it? And so on. The point being, again, not the accuracy, and I use that in air quotes, not the accuracy of the, the retelling of the story, uh, but, but more the, the idea of recalling a memory and it's Chuck's memory. And the whole um, exercise, if you will, of going through this, it doesn't matter if it's an accurate memory. Uh, Chuck's wife, if she'd been there, might have said, well, don't you remember it was this way, not that way? It doesn't matter. It's, it's his memory, and the more that he recycles that memory, the more it is reinforced. It becomes, um, in a sense, a kind of reassurance of who he is. So this is part of what we're looking at in, in terms of the um, contribution of this research from the individual's perspective. Can we give them a sense of self in the moment? And I don't mean literally give it to them, but as a result of going through this, uh, let me put it to you this way. Um, uh, I'm grateful that I myself, as far as I know, am not uh, experiencing uh, the, the kind of cognitive decline of Alzheimer's dementia. But there is a sense that an individual starts to lose themselves, or him or herself. They, be, they, they know what is happening, and they're feeling a tremendous amount of anxiety <coughs> around the fact that they are not the person that they were. And in fact, um, uh, this is one of the challenges of working with uh, this group. It's a very vulnerable group. Uh, you can evoke memories that can be positive, but you can also evoke very painful memories. And at one point in the session, um, Chuck stopped and he looked at me and he said, you know, I'm not the person that I used to be. You're not seeing the Chuck that I once was. And he had tears in his eyes. And uh, so I simply, you know, we had a sort of a quiet two seconds and I, and I said to him, well, you know, I'm really enjoying the person that Chuck is with me right here now, so that's, that's great. And he moved on from there. So it's a very vulnerable population, um, but by the same token, it, if, if the, that anxiety about the loss of self can somehow be uh, mitigated in even some small way by having this reinforcement of the self through the storytelling, um, that's, that's a good thing, uh, at least from, from my perspective. Um, so, uh, so to go back to something a little more researchy, um, we've been trying to, this is uh, the pilot study, so the three individuals, I'm just telling you uh, one of them, Chuck's story. And on the, the bottom, how we've made sense of this uh, with the tokens themselves, that the representations in some cases had a higher resonance, that is, high association that there was a, almost a one-to-one -one connection between the representation and the memory recall. Uh, so that was the, um, the stock chart there and, um, and the Hilroy, where the, the story was retold um, pretty much verbatim. 
Um, then uh, there were cases where there was absolutely no resonance with the, the nun token. Uh, there was, there was uh, an instance of the delayed resonance. The Trudeau was acknowledged. Oh, well, there's Pierre Trudeau. Other stories about Pierre Trudeau, but not Pierre Trudeau relative to bilingualism in, and his father. Um, but that delayed, uh, five weeks later, he then told that story about Pierre Trudeau and bilingualism and his dad. Um, there was a new resonance. The, the Italy, the fact of looking at the map, did not take him back to his childhood in Little Italy, but pointing to Bologna is connected with the story about his uh, father and uh, uh, his work with Canada Packers. Uh, I thought actually it was a great connection. Oh, Bologna, Bologna, hmm, meat packers. So, uh, you know, there was an association going on and, you know, that's just, that's also an, an exercising of, of the brain and, and making, um, making connections. Um, so that's, that's pretty much uh, Chuck's story. And so now, um, I, I still have to get back to the question of what does this have to do with um, uh, information and what does this have to do for that matter with um, uh, knowledge organization. Um, so uh, there are two things here. First of all, the idea of uh, using representations to reinforce memories. And there are commercial companies who are doing this now. Um, you can buy kits that have CDs and videos and so on for a certain period of time in history, in a person's history. So it might be, you know, uh, songs and stories and films and um, photographs from the Second World War. And it's sort of a generic prompting of, of memory. Um, and then there are also, uh, there's also work being done with uh, sense cams where um, the individual can, uh, there's a colleague at the University of Toronto who's doing this work, uh, where a person can actually wear a small um, cam uh, camera, video, and uh, go through their day and at the end of the day replay their day to themselves, just to sort of remind them of what, what they did today. Um, but what we're thinking about is we have all these huge, fast quantities of resources in repositories. We have. Um, collections, museum collections, and we have libraries, and we have digital resources, and so on. And if we could uh, be able to take someone's stories and give them representations from those vast stores of uh, information to, in fact, serve as these kinds of uh, memory aids to uh, recalling a, a memory, that would be a very productive use of of, and another kind of use for um, information, um, all of our various information resources. So all the work that we do to put together collections and uh, cultural records and so on could be mobilized to uh, assist individuals who are going through a cognitive decline. Um, and we're also thinking in terms of that concept of uh, brain plasticity. Um, you know, prevailing wisdom uh, 20, 30 years ago was that you, you had your brain cells, you were born with your brain cells, you developed, you've probably heard recently about the IQ studies where they're saying that IQ changes uh, can change within short periods of time, across time and so on, so it could even be temporal, um, and which is you know, all the parents will jump on in terms of <laughs> smartening up their kids. Uh, but also good news for uh, the prevailing wisdom that said we had what we had in across time, you know, um, excuse the expression, but you know, like a beach, and then you die, um, and you know that was it was too bad. Your brain would decline, and and there was no hope for you. And of course, um, studies have now shown a tremendous amount of flexibility on the part of the brain, where there has where there's damage, other parts of the brain can take over and assume those um, those functions. So if in fact every time we uh, can help someone to do this, are we in fact, if you will, it's a sort of a vague concept, but strengthening the brain, that we are uh, adding to the parts that are not yet damaged, giving, what, giving them what they need to be able to take over from a part that, that has been damaged. So we're building on that idea of uh, plasticity. 
So, um, next steps. We've done our pilot, we've analyzed the, the data, and uh, the, the next stage we have uh, some more individuals to do a similar activity with. Uh, we were actually considering the question of uh, whether or not we should ask the individuals, rather than the research team figuring out what tokens to provide as representations, to have the individuals bring something to the session to talk about. And so we, um, we consulted with um, uh, folks who are very knowledgeable uh, at the Alzheimer's Society, and they said, well, it's, it's a nice idea, however, it could cause anxiety, a kind of performance anxiety. So uh, if I um, ask Steve to bring something to talk about, he may uh, be concerned about, is this the right thing? Should I bring this or should I bring that? Or, well, if I bring this, maybe it says too much about me or maybe it says too little and so on. So their advice to us was continue doing what you're doing um, just to see what other patterns uh, may, may arise across time. Um, so y you might sort of challenge me a bit and say, well, you know, why do this if you can't actually measure change? I mean, how do you know if this is helping? And the answer is, we don't know. But uh, we're neither clinically um, capable of measuring, and nor do I think it's necessary to measure. Um, the thing with individuals with Alzheimer's dementia is they're very much in the moment. So you go with their stories. Um, we're also working just with the individuals, not with their families or caregivers, because invariably caregivers and families have a different version. They want to say things like, don't you remember? Which, of course, if they remembered the same version that the family member had, then we probably wouldn't be there. So uh, this is Chuck's story or Alice's story or Cara's story or, or whatever. So we're just, um, we, we're not measuring, we cannot measure, but we do believe that there is a role that information professionals could play in helping to, um, in fact, uh, provide some resources to uh, reinforce memory. So uh, this is really where we're, we're moving towards. Um, if we can uh, target that information, this is what we do all the time. Target information to the particular needs of an individual. Do it in a meaningful way. Looking at the concept of representations. It makes sense to the recipient. However that's expressed, tactile, we're, we're also going to uh, bring in other modalities, uh, something as, that would appeal to the sense of smell or taste or whatever. Uh, then this may, in fact, um, offer some opportunities for um, continuing to live uh, independent lives for, for as long as possible. And even if it has nothing to do with extending capabilities, if it does give that individual a sense of selfness in that moment, a sense of being uh, and being who they are in that moment, um, and if that offers some uh, reassurance, however uh, temporary, well, I think uh, we'll, have, we'll have done something that's, uh, that's worthwhile. So I'll just uh, finish that. Now that should clear up a few things around here. Mainly. So, Chuck's story, and I love your comments and questions. I have a couple. Um, wouldn't you be wary if they brought their own mnemonic to remember things that they wouldn't, they would just focus on that and not all the other things you're trying to bring up, bring out? And you know, anything can happen. So of course I have to say this is exploratory. Mm -hmm. This is like mm -hmm. so exploratory as to be almost um, magical, mystical, I suppose. But. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we feel very fortunate to have been given funding to do mm -hmm. this. Um, uh, so, yeah, that could happen, but that will tell us something as well. Oh, okay. I think so. You would focus on that one thing and see what memory you've got going on. Yeah. 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 Ye
instead of up on top. Um, so to focus on the one and not go. Right. Yeah. Uh, if, and actually, thanks for bringing up that question. Is that uh, reminds me of um, something I forgot to say. In this next uh, stage, what we are going to do is add another visit. So um, we'll go and you know listen to the story, come back with the tokens, see what happens, and then have a subsequent oh, yeah. visit okay. to bring back the, first um, the, the same tokens plus some additional ones that may have been evoked, right. just to see uh, if there's any difference, if the story is yet again. I mean, I, I'm pretty certain if I gave Chuck the graph and the Hilroy, I would get those stories because he was so passionate about them. He was so emotionally invested in them the first time. Although, to be truthful, he was emotionally invested in all the stories, but just um, those, whenever uh, a story, whenever he told a story that began with, oh, that reminds me that, that was something we were particularly uh, interested in and seeing if we could evoke that and it came back in the same fashion. So he just focused on that and didn't add any details or maybe had fewer details. Well, that's okay. But um, it did seem that invariably, um, and that's what we want to test in this next phase, that if we take those tokens back, do we get even more? Do, do the stories get richer? Um, richer, I put that in quotes. Uh, do they, expand more to do more people or, you know this is where that narrative arc comes in do we add more events more people more um, sensory information and so on I don't think did I answer your question yeah you did very well okay thanks did you have a specific process for token selection as far as picking a map of Italy versus picking a pizza or something like that I'm just wondering um, how you how you address that variable and that different tokens would evoke different memories. Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, so you probably guessed it was not a highly scientific process, <laughs> um, and that that is one thing that we will be watching for as we deal with. Uh, we have eight more people that we're going to be uh, working with to see. So so this thing about the the, the nun. Um, what, what I did not want to do, <coughs> excuse me, was to bring something that was just um, like sort of a one-on-one. -on -one. So, if someone, um, uh, if uh, Hurley or Hurley, she gets picked on. She's right here. <laughs> if she were to tell me a story about chocolate cake, you know, and she loves chocolate cake and she eats chocolate cake every day, and boy, she wishes she could eat it. 15 times a day and you know so and then I came back and I brought chocolate cake I mean that's kind of that's a you know she talk about chocolate cake and that was that was not the idea to talk about well I couldn't you know I couldn't represent um, the nun and the school and so on so I didn't we didn't want to prompt we didn't want to give anything that was going to necessarily cause a you know to cheat and give a really clear prompt so I, my suspicion with the, the nun is that um, this representation, it, it, well, it's a representation of a representation, I guess. You know, it's sort of further back, the further back you get from the actual, um, the actual thing itself. Um, uh, and then the rest of the map of Italy. Well, yeah, I probably could have done pizza or something like that, but he didn't actually, uh, he, he, he didn't talk about pizza. I could have done that and, you know, it might have been related and he might eventually have gotten to it. Uh, I brought the map of Italy because if you can even see it on, in this microprint edition here, it's got Italy in big letters. So that was getting pretty close to, to um, what is it? game that kids play, you know, don't give the secret away. Right? So it was pretty close to a direct prompt, but you didn't pick it up in, in that way. So it was not a scientific process whatsoever. It was sort of a balance between, um, like the stock chart was not the thousand point. It was a representation of, um, it, was that, it was Dow Jones. So it was a representation of that, um, et cetera. So it was somewhere just trying to strike a balance. Um, so we have no hypotheses that we're testing here. 
we're just kind of seeing what comes out of this and maybe somewhere down the road subsequent study could actually mm -hmm. test some, some things very specifically. It's just adding the something. It, it looks like this kind of thing remind me because I just talked with Hope about it, some indexing things. It looks like the researchers served as an indexer who try to find the representation of the story, and uh, which is the tokens. And uh, they assign the token to the kind of like author, which is the participant in this case. And uh, it doesn't, it seems, it doesn't always be, it's not always the case that the tokens, the indexer find, will lead to the original story that the author is creating. That sounds like an indexing problem that, that the triangle there. For me, it looks like. So the indexer tried to get what the authors mean in their original story. But that, that's always, that, that not always lead to what the authors think of. So for example, you give the map. You expect them to think of what, where they grew up. But they actually think of what their father, what their father did. And they lead to their their father's career on that kind of thing. Yeah, and, and you know th that's why we struggled with. Uh, we were coming up with the representation. Yes. The token should, in fact, um, should the token have in, been offered by the author, the storyteller, him or herself, and that's actually what we did want to um, try out with the next round. But of course, uh, the, the advice was not to do it for very different reasons. Yes. The anxiety but, producing. But it is an indexing yeah. problem. It's an interesting Because yeah. at the first round, you, you, uh, the researchers assigned the tokens. That's, the, that's why we can see that's kind of this. Sometimes it matches well, and it leads to the story you want to see. Sometimes it's not. And maybe it's, it's even more interesting to see. Like, how it doesn't match, how it matches. Yeah. Like, yeah. If you do this way, you can see this. Otherwise, if they provide their terms, let's author provided keywords, it's a different story. Yeah, no, I, I, believe me, we've had very, very long, long uh, discussions about this, you know, how, and we're, we're very mindful of the fact that we're kind of messing around in the sandbox here. Uh, I mean, there's a, a kind of rigor to it, but it's a pretty loosey-goosey kind of um, rigor. Um, so, yeah, we have talked a lot about, about that idea that there, our, you know, my, our associations with the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but by the same token, again, it, it, the idea is not to say how well does the token um, work, but more what does the individual do with that token? You know, do they in fact see that representation as evoking part of the story, all of the story, none of the story that they told initially? Mm -hmm. um, or do they tell a totally different story around that? So, you know, we really struggled with, it's not about the tokens, although ultimately it could be because we're saying we're going to work with repositories, and you know we know somebody has some, which is what these commercial companies do to some degree, uh, although that's very fixed and this could be quite fluid. Um, but you know we, we could be saying, well, we're going to feed uh, feed you lots of these representations, and some might evoke something, and some and some might not. Part of me says, well, this is mm, perhaps not unlike when any of us go to. I don't know, an art gallery or a sculpture garden or something, it means something to each of us uniquely, but it's still the representation or the artifact or yeah. you know, the work that evokes something in us. So part of it is, is again, just it's, it's such an individual thing. So we're, we're, trying to, we're, we're trying to cross a bridge over a, a rushing river and blindfolded and not sure where the steps are, but somehow we're managing to make some progress maybe. I don't, don't know if that answers the question. It's very interesting to see like, this kind of like mapping. So there are high uh, re reliance uh, yeah. mapping where they can just get it correctly, very good. They're delayed and they are sequential. Different. Yeah. 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 Y
I mean, I think the, the exciting thing to me from the KO perspective is the whole idea of representation. Um, so I'm, uh, I'd say more about it if, if I could, but we're just, we're, we're, I, I know it's there and we, we need to explore that more too in terms of um, other aspects of the literature. Um, this is kind of along with that. Is is, I know it's very exploratory, but is the goal perhaps to, when you say independence and quality of life, is that more to real, realize what, what's going on around them or remember their memory, or is it ways to make them more um, independent in the sense of how they act every day? I mean, could, are, we, are you looking eventually to find, to index, you know, or to, have tokens that remind them of the people in their lives that they should know, or the, you know, or processes that they should be able to do independently. I mean, I don't, I don't know too much about Alzheimer's and so forth, but is it eventually more of a quality of life like memory and enjoying your memory, or is it more quality of life like being able to live independently um, as far as daily processes and such? Right, well, um, so my answer to that is, I think it's two things. I think it could be that, mm -hmm. um, that if it evokes <laughs> it, it evokes a memory that um, situates you relative to other people. So um, when Chuck <coughs> told the story, Bologna, oh yeah, and there's a can of Packer's wheat truck, and my dad, and da da da, he was remembering someone who was, <coughs> excuse me, important in his, in his life. Um, but at some point, and of course we're just dealing with people who are in early stage, so, uh, but at some point, that could be lost, that memory of individuals, you know, that they, you know, uh, the client could have a sense that the person is important in their life, but not necessarily know it's a, a daughter or a, mm -hmm. a husband or you know, what, partner or whatever. Um, but the other part of this, <clears throat> so, okay, so if that sort of thing is, uh, those memories are reinforced and it, you know, continues to help people in their day-to-day -day lives, that's great. Mm -hmm. but. I think the other part is, and I sort of think it's uh, somewhat analogous when you when you travel or you know you go to a, uh, a party and you don't know anybody. You, as you tell your stories, and you're traveling and someone's sort of you know you get into the situation where someone's saying, well, who are you? But they may not put it that way, but you are trying to reveal who you are. So we're always telling stories about ourselves. And to me, that may be the more powerful, mm -hmm. that it's the fact of, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the story is really about Chuck. Mm -hmm. I mean, a story is a story. It, it could be about it's just something that we might say, quote unquote, his, his wife might say, oh, he's making that up. It doesn't matter. It's his story. So if in that sense, um, they continue to uh, be able to feel some sense of self Mm -hmm. In a world that's, you know, literally becoming, you, you, you enter a world, I believe, and I, I don't know from first-hand experience, I know from um, working with people, and, and uh, my mother had on some of the and the people that she lived with, you do have a sense that this is, a, they're strangers in a strange land. Mm -hmm. So if somehow telling a story about or herself, it doesn't matter if it's accurate. They're still situated as someone in a time and space, which perhaps sounds a bit abstract, but I think we can all get that sense of you go to a party, you go to a new place, and who am I? Who, who am I in, in Singapore? Um, who am I at the cocktail party? You know? My interest is also, also in uh, representation. Um, but uh, it's interesting to me that you gave Chuck six objects. But in traditional indexing or uh, cataloging, we use um, texts, right? And it's just like in this picture, I was just looking at this. Yeah. And picture itself is not clear enough. So you have to label everything to make sure that people get it, and that this is the tree, that's the house. 
uh, uh, now I understand that, that there is a, a match between those two for most people, but there's also a, a mismatch, right? Like that shirt, I wouldn't call it a shirt. Do <laughs> 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 you know what call it a shirt? Under shirt. <laughs> well, Quite <few>. yeah. <laughs> and, well, but of course the door is the door is the door. Oh, okay, okay, but. Um, Except when it's a joke. Sorry. But when you give people objects, there can be so many different kinds of associations or interpretations. Mm -hmm. Like this nun, right? I didn't get it at first before you said it was mm -hmm. a nun. I didn't even. I thought it was some Russian doll thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> so. Maybe Chuck didn't get it that was a nun. I don't know. I'm yeah, just yeah. saying it's a representation issue. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So would you, I, I, well, I, have you planned to use text instead of objects as tokens in the future? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> and why not? Um, well, I many reasons come to mind, and, and, and we actually just haven't even thought about it. Partially because, uh, although in, in this case, with this particular individual, um, these, these were actual autograph, I'm, I'm sorry, objects, um, photograph, you know, physical token maps, and so on, um, we, if we will, in the next iteration, also try to introduce some of the other modalities. So touch, smell, taste, uh, sight, hearing, of course. Um, so we haven't thought about text because text seems, and I'm just saying this right now, yet once, once more removed. So if I could have used the word, if, so none, if I said none, and you know, well, use the word, first of all, sometimes um, reading ability can be compromised, not in, this individual's case, and not usually in, in the mild early stage of uh, Alzheimer's dementia. But um, part of it is, you know, what kind of text? So none, okay, but should we say uh, none at elementary school or, you know, so um, we haven't thought about it, but we could talk about it. Okay. Uh, but we're, we're mostly interested not in uh, how an individual interprets a word and response to it, but more uh, physicality, some of the, the, the senses. Um, Isn't there are, text, in fact, in all five except the none? And it couldn't it be the text in those tokens that evoke the memory instead mm -hmm. of the visual? Could be. Mm -hmm. Could be. So, I would suggest take away the visuals, put the text only, and see if you evoke the same memory. Could do that. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Well, well, I was just thinking about um, when my dad was um, having dementia, one of the things that they did a lot was play music. Mm. And so everybody would, I, my husband and I were wondering if they're going to play when we're old, you know, I mean, we can't do those same songs, we don't remember the words. I think it's going to be ABBA or something. But, um, but it was really interesting because Every now and then, some of them would get up and dance. And there's one one, I'm trying to remember the name of the the place. It's on Wisconsin Avenue. It's a big old dance hall music place where they have concerts. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, this one woman used to go there when she was a teenager. And so she got dancing <coughs> on the little floor and everything. I think the music might be very evocative. Yeah. And yeah. they'd sing along. And yeah, now, uh, Chuck's background was that he was, in fact, uh, an investment manager. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, we were, I was looking for opportunities where he might talk about music, for example, but he didn't. Um, and I don't want to be too reductionist, but just as a handy label, he was more analytical. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and. You know, when he talked about food, even he didn't talk about mm. foods that he particularly enjoyed. He just said, "Well, you know, my uh, my Italian friends sometimes I go to their place for lunch, and you know, the food was good." But he didn't go into what kind of food, or you know, and sometimes I'd, I'd say something like, "Oh, and you know, was there something in particular 
if, if I felt he was heading on that way, I, I was in anything particular that you enjoyed. But he he was um, he was a very um, a very visual, uh, very visual individual. So actually, that that was part of it too. That I know he um, he he did say things, and actually, so early in Charles, your points are really well taken. He did talk in ways that were text-like. So he would say, you know, the stock chart, the Dow Jones stock, doing this and so on. So, uh, but totally, if um, uh, one of the individuals, actually, in the pilot, um, was a very, um, uh, very kinesthetic. He, he had been a uh, professional soccer player. And so um, one of the things that we brought for him was a jersey, uh, which was kind of, to go back to Tyler's point, that was a bit of cheating, but anyway, it was to get it, you know, see what he would do with that. It wasn't his team, but it was a soccer jersey. And one of the things he did when we were talking was, um, he wasn't much of a talker, but he would say, uh, I, I, so I said, well, you know, tell me a little bit more about what it was like playing soccer. So he said, well, I'll show you. So he actually, you know, stood up and was showing me how to do kicks and you know, all that stuff. I'm not a soccer player, so I'm a football player if you're from Europe uh, or elsewhere. Um, and so I won't do that. But uh, so he was very kinesthetic, uh, and which was quite challenging because um, we, we, our tokens might have had to have been more performative. But so we went with the tactile with him. A lot of the the tokens were, were tactile. Anyway, so, the, the thanks, yes, that says something about the textual. Well, the lady, the lady who did the dancing also kept trying to get somebody to dance. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody was willing to do that. Yeah, and of course Especially there are... her walker. <laughs> there are, of course, uh, wonderful stories for people who are uh, progressing through the, uh, the life course of the disease who hear music and can who may not even be able to speak, but can sing, and then can sing all of the lyrics. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so, um, Richard. Yeah, that just reminded me of something that which wasn't what I was going to say. I mean, my mother has Alzheimer's. And it's pretty clear when she looks at my eyes that she sees my father who she was divorced from almost 50 years ago. And because she says, well, gosh, it's been a long time. <laughs> you know, she's like, but but that's nice. encouraging that she, she recognizes it's been a long time. I mean, that's a... a and that's uh, old. I look like he did that. But <laughs> what I was thinking goes to the knowledge organization piece here, which I think uh, is um, has to do with... Uh, the tokens and their uh, closeness or distance from the thing they represent. And I was thinking, both in the case of the nun and the map of Italy, that you might be, say, two or three steps yeah. away instead of just one step away. Right. And I, I wondered whether maybe a map of Little Italy is too obvious, or of course it looks different now than it did when he was growing up, but um, maybe it has to do with that distance, and maybe that distance is measurable. Yeah, and when he was talking about the Lily, and I know you know something about Toronto, uh, one of the things he talked about was um, when the trains would come in in uh, the fall with the grapes and the grape juice. Uh, and so it would have been possible to um, uh, say, you know, have uh, one of the uh, bucket from the grape juice company or something you know, like that, or a picture, a, a, an historical picture of that. Uh, and so I mean, this goes back to Tyler's point about you know, how, to, how do we choose in a very unscientific way. But, but I am intrigued by, by that notion of how far removed. And, and I'd be grateful to anyone who can help out with that. Um, and seriously, uh, part of the reason of giving you this, um, my email is on there. And if you, if you have any thoughts and suggestions, we would desperately welcome them. Desperately welcome them. Because these are some of the things that are fascinating about the project. But you know, how do you measure that? Yeah, 
how many how many times removed the kind of genealogy of representation which that might be a project for the AIO group. <laughs> um, uh, yes. Just to add, I was thinking because my grandfather and grandmother were dementia as well, and uh, it's interesting because I was thinking that maybe it would be interesting to test people, like to talk to people with two sets of representations, because like in in their case, for example, you know, I'm not married, so I call my grandmother, and she said, you know, we talk about it, and she's like, oh, have you met anyone? And she's not meeting something, right? It's like, no, Grandma, I haven't. And it leads her right into this story about how she met her husband. <laughs> right? So off that abstraction of right. me being unmarried. But if you're at the dinner table and you say, and they're, you know, they're doing whatever, and you say, oh, you two have such a great relationship, like, about them, mm -hmm. it launches them, her into the same story. Interesting. So, like, two different spurs, and they're still, I mean, they're not a fan. He, you know, he's had it for a long time, she hasn't. But um, this two different things at two, at two different levels of abstraction lead to the very same story told in like pretty much the exact same way. And so if the token, in, like so you said the token doesn't matter so much, so in some ways seeing what two different tokens would do might be interesting as well, or a text-based thing, or, you know what I mean? So at different levels of abstraction mm -hmm. to see what they get to. Yeah, that's Thank you. Yes. That's, that's very helpful. It's very interesting. I, I think to some degree that the to some degree Chuck did that with the oh there's Bologna, mm -hmm. Bologna, Bologna meat. Da -da. Mm -hmm. um, so you know there are many ways to to a story. Um, and I have to say you know talking to him, um, the stories were wonderful. I didn't care if they were real or true or anything. They're just great <laughs> stories. <laughs> I'd like to introduce a random token, one that has nothing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I would venture for the people will make make me. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Would you like to offer the first honor? <laughs> <laughs> I think anything would do, as long as it has nothing to do with what you've heard. In some ways, the nun was. Because he thought it was a Dungeons and Dragons token, which didn't necessarily mean anything to them. And that would have been a good question. What do you mean, does it dragons? Have you played? Yeah, no, I, we could certainly, I, I was doing a follow up with him, but I certainly could have done that. I was, um, first of all, we're, we're learning a lot through this uh, pilot. But secondly, I was trying to be so careful not to um, lead the story in any way. I mean, even the probing I was really, really careful. Um, but there are, uh, <coughs> The name escapes me at the moment, but there was a study, uh, a study done um, with individuals with Alzheimer's dementia, um, I believe a British researcher who showed photographs, um, but asked a very leading question. I mean, they were photographs of where the person had grown up. So, you know, what's this a picture of? Or this a picture of our home? Well. You know, and uh, just a series of leading questions that were, in fact, scripted. Uh, but that was um, sort of looking at the degree of, of recall. So I was trying to be very careful not to lead in any way. But yeah, it would have been interesting to know why. I, I mean, I thought Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> what I'm looking at, they were like, really? <laughs> but of course, it was my token. But thank you. That's, that's a great idea. For your tokens are very tactile. Have you thought of using a computer screen to represent the objects at all? Or like an iPad or anything like that? Yeah, and that's a really interesting question. And particularly, I don't know if any of you saw this 60 Minutes um, about autism use of iPads with autistic kids. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually uh, just, uh, as it turns out, it's a researcher uh, in our own faculty who's, who's working on that project. Um, uh, yeah, thought about it. Um, and in Chuck's case, because regrettably he was so young, he, he himself was very um, familiar with, with computers. Uh, technology can be um, challenging. Um, so the other thing we, we're trying to be very, very careful of, because it is a vulnerable population, is not to 
cause anxiety and stress. The memories are probably stressful enough unless they're pleasant memories, but we have no idea where these things are going to go. In fact, you know, working with the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto, they have social workers. People come to um, the building where they are. Uh, they're selected from groups, so they actually come to the building, and part of the reason is, A, I don't want to go into their homes or residences, <coughs> and I think that's very anxiety-provoking. Uh, but B, because there are social workers available, so if anything happens, and thankfully so far with the three, nothing happened, but if it does, they're available too. But aren't nuns anxiety? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm first generation and have a ton of nuns. And I don't think they don't conjure up good memories. <laughs> I have to be uh, uh, I was not raised that way, and, uh, but I have many friends who. Uh, so I show them this brochure, and they, you know, yeah. say, "Why did you put the nun in there?" You know, <laughs> I would wager you get a fair, uh, more anxiety looking at the Dow Jones. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a question about um, participant selection, just because the variant stages of, of something like Alzheimer's dementia, and then also if you account for like a variable of medication or anything like that, just at what stage do you select someone for that process? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, our, our criteria for selection, uh, n number one, um, they would have, and so when people receive an actual diagnosis of early stage Alzheimer's dementia from a physician or a gerontologist or a neurologist or whomever, um, then they call, they don't always, but they may call the uh, Alzheimer's Society of Toronto and they offer a range of support services. Um, so it's someone who has um, been diagnosed and who self-identifies and is um, recognized. Uh, and the Alzheimer's Society has the criteria to how these stages go. They're pretty fluid. Um, so uh, <clears throat> typically someone who continues to live on their, their own or with a you know, family member, uh, someone who continues to be somewhat self-sufficient, may need some some care, some assist, but um, they're not yet in a situation where uh, they are fully assisted, when they require full assistance. Um, so that criteria. And then um, they are drawn from groups, so the Alzheimer's Society has a number of, of groups. So two of these um, pilot uh, test participants were men from a men's group, and it's a, their support group, so their peer, peer support. So I, I was invited to go into the groups, talk about the study, uh, ask if anyone wanted to volunteer, so they could volunteer. And um, uh, they, so this is where it gets tricky, because there are those who say, um, can they provide um, an informed consent? <laughs> uh, which is a question that, I appreciate the question, but frankly it, it makes me a little angry. Because unfortunately, and so again, I'm going to step on my soapbox here, someone gets the diagnosis. I figure if I ever get the diagnosis, I'm not telling anybody because, you know, you hear those doors shutting faster than you can say Alzheimer's dementia. And all of a sudden, today you're one person, and after that you're another person, you're non-compass mentis, you're, you're, out of, you know, you're out of society, you're no longer apart, you're highly stigmatized, it is a very, very abrupt and crushing label. So, you know, early stage, we can talk about it. Uh, I, I said to Chuck, you know, can you explain the study? I said, you know, tell me, tell me what this sounds like to you. And, you know, he, he, you know, he clearly understood what was going on. And clearly, uh, we make it very clear, of course, they can leave at any time. You know, if we're in the middle of a sentence, they want to leave. It's perfectly fine. Uh, so we dealt, we had to deal with that issue of whether or not we also needed a caregiver's signed permission. And uh, at least for the pilot, we, um, we were compromised on a verbal discussion with a caregiver that the participant had designated as someone to contact. So 
those sort of a compromise? It's difficult. It's a difficult question. My feeling is uh, perfectly, you know, it was a, as informed consent as certainly I could give, you know. So, no, for someone who was further along in, in the, the like course of the disease, that would be highly problematic. Would that be an evolution for the study potentially? To well, potentially, although um, at a certain point, uh, there just may be too much cognitive damage. Now, we actually uh, explored the possibility of, um, uh, there's a very close link between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's dementia, so uh, it's very close, like 90, 95% of those who are born with Down syndrome will develop, if they live a full life, it's like, you know, double jeopardy, they live a full life and they, they, uh, they will almost inevitably develop Alzheimer's dementia. So, you know, we talked about the possibility of working with the Down, Down population, um, but we were advised that uh, with two issues there. I mean, it's an interesting prospect, but... One more medical question. I don't, it's a little aside, but did he smoke? I know smoking uh, exacerbates or provokes Alzheimer's. Do you know if he smoked? Um, uh, if he ever had, yeah. he certainly doesn't now. But you I don't, don't know? I don't oh. know. Yeah. Uh, certainly the, um, the soccer player did not. He was very, 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 very fit. Yeah. And he showed me the moves. I was convinced. Just one more thing you oh. just jumped to my mind. I think um, in terms of the, we just talked about the distance between the tokens and mm -hmm. the memory, mm -hmm. uh, maybe the response from the participant is an indicator for that. If they, if they find the link, Immediate, maybe it's just very good, close, or delayed is further, maybe, or no response is another indicator. So the, the postage stamp would be further because it take, took longer time. Yeah, it took longer time. It's a delay. So that might be, yeah. Yeah, the postage stamp he did identify. Yeah. yeah. But, but he didn't yeah. relate it to the story, but he said Yeah, you said delayed. You said delayed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah um, when you were starting, when you were starting this series, um, that are um, very, uh, to which the subject is very uh, emotionally involved, you know. And uh, maybe these are the kind of memories that they would remember anyway. Uh, whereas uh, I'm thinking more like everyday things that they might have to remember, like who is this person and this kind of things, that they would be prone to forget. Uh, I don't know if it would be, uh, as if maybe you, you, you trigger memories that maybe they wouldn't forget, so how would you know that for uh, to what extent it could be extended to more? Um, everyday life actions or memories or Yeah, well, um, so the, the, the question that uh, I started with, and we had actually uh, four or five different questions to, to start with, but, you know, so in this particular case, the question was, you know, tell me about something that you like to do. So that could have been an everyday, um, you know, you could have started telling me about everyday stuff. Um, now, he was, my, my sense was he was trying to figure out a, a good answer to give me. Uh, so, you know, it took about mm, five minutes to get into it. And once once he got into stories, you know, wind him up, let him go. He was great. Uh, very, very loquacious. But he could have. He could have in response to that question. You know, and, and we had we had very neutral <coughs> starting questions, you know. Um, is there a particular food you like to eat? Or, you know, is there a... Um, Kind of, what, what's your favorite piece of clothing to wear, or something like that? You know, very fluffy, happy, if you will, um, just something getting started. So he could have talked about three days, I mean, I take your point. Um, 
the research that uh, Ron Becker is doing uh, around this, and he's working more with um, uh, two, two things, handheld devices and how they can assist in daily living, so it would be reminding somebody of that they've got a doctor's appointment or a dental appointment or their daughter is coming over or you know whatever. Um, so those kinds of everyday life assist um, technologies are being developed. But Ron and his group also did um, a, a project, a study in a project where they got together with the uh, client and the client's caregivers and, or, or family, if they happen to be family, and um, the individual told a, a story. Um, and they, they could just, you know, basically tell us, tell us your life story kind of thing. And then the family members would chip in and stuff. And, and they were, you know, told about this beforehand so that they could bring pictures, photographs, um, and so on. And maybe they'd mention music or some event or, you know, and then the grandchildren were born and la, la, la. And so what they did was they uh, recorded the stories. Um, they took the uh, photographs and, you know, whatever the family or the individual had brought to the session as artifacts, if you will, or evidence. Um, and they put all of this together and added some other things, if appropriate, like a piece of music, and they put it into a video. So it's like a, a life story video. And then they played it back to the um, individual. And you know, then they asked some questions. How, how was that for you? Blah, blah, blah. You know, basically they said, well, it was lovely to relive those memories and gave me happiness or they, you know, made me feel sad or whatever. But they, so they were just, so that, that they now have that video to play over and over and over. And you know, the idea being it might help them to continue to recall life events that are important to them. And so uh, in talking with Ron, I mean, one of the things that we see as being different about this study is that that, that is an this is no value judgment, but that's a, a that's a fixed artifact now. That is that life story, and with family members also contributing, or you know, caregivers or significant people in this person's life contributing. But it's fixed. It is the video of the life, and so what we're looking at is more the you know are there. It doesn't matter if they, as I said, it doesn't matter. If Chuck tells me a different story. It's still his story. So we're we're looking at more fluidity. But um, I think your question was about everyday events, and I think there are people who are doing research on that and trying to reinforce who's important in your life, what's important, you know, parts of your home, whatever. So there's research being done on that. I don't know that really answered your question, but there's another story. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lynn. <laughs> we all have uh, Professor Howard's email. <laughs> yeah, so if your memory is jogged, you send us an email. Or if you think of anything, we really would be grateful for your contribution. Thank you. Thank you for coming.